safe and sound at home again. Let the waters roar, Jack. Safe and sound at home again. Let the waters roar, Jack. One we've tossed on the rolling main. Now we're safe ashore, Jack. Don't forget your old shipmate. Rolly, 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 ride -o. Hello, Cohasset, and welcome to the 2021 Selectman Debate. I'm Mark DiGiacomo, and tonight I will be your moderator. This year, there is one seat open uh, on the Board of Selectmen, and we have two candidates running for that seat, both of whom are with me tonight. Our candidates are uh, Paul Schubert and Jean Haley DePold. Is it DePold? Hello. Yes, yes. Okay, I wanted to make sure Jean. Haley DePold. <laughs> okay. Thanks for both of you um, for joining us tonight. So tonight we have uh, only one hour. I've been told to make sure that we cut it short, uh, cut it after one hour. Uh, and we're going to discuss some of the more pressing issues uh, that I feel uh, Cohasset might be interested in. Um, anyone who joins us, I will ask them to make sure they keep their phones on mute. Um, I don't see any videos. If you feel it's necessary for us to see your smiling face, that's fine. Otherwise, um, you can cut your video as well. I'll leave that up to the audience. Um, we'll be start, I will start out by giving each candidate just a minute or two to introduce themselves, talk a little about their educational work and civic um, history, uh, and then we'll get into uh, the questions. I have about four or five areas that I will be asking uh, the candidates about. Uh, frankly, any one of them we could probably talk half an hour on we'll have less than 10 minutes each. So I would ask the candidates, try to keep your answers down to a couple minutes. I, I will have follow-up questions uh, throughout and we'll, we'll do the best we can. I'll try to keep the time as even as I can um, between the two of you uh, as well. Um, so uh, why don't we start out at this point um, with uh, brief introductions and let's, uh, let's let the challenger start out. Jean? Hi, thanks very much, Mark. And thank you, Paul, for agreeing to be on this forum as well. So my name is Jean Healy Dippold, and I'm running for the open seat on the select board. Just a little background about me. My husband, Alex, and I moved to Cohasset in 2008, although I'm originally from Hingham. Um, by way of education, I went to Rice University, where I was a triple major in economics, history, and policy studies. I then went to law school. and now I'm a lawyer. My husband and I have two children who are 11 and nine years old. Um, when I first moved to Cohasset, I was elected to the planning board. And right now I serve on the advisory committee. Uh, with respect to my work background, I have spent most of my career in public service. I uh, started my career working as a government attorney, protecting consumers, and I've continued to do so for over 15 years. Um, quite some time ago, I won't say the exact date, I was appointed as a state assistant attorney general for Massachusetts at the AG's office. I prosecuted mortgage business and other scams in order to protect consumers and recover money. A few years later, Congress created a new federal agency called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and I was recruited to help start the agency's Office of Enforcement in light of my state prosecution work. Since then, I've served in many roles at my agency, including creating and leading strategic plans for the United States in certain areas, such as mortgages and helping older Americans. I also lead complex investigations and cases in order to recover money for consumers. Once the Bureau was up and going, I returned to Cohasset to work with my, to live with my family and work remotely for my agency where I still work. Um, finally, and probably most important, so that's a very quick background on me. I'm running for select board because I believe that our town can and should move forward from the pandemic together. If elected, I would prioritize the following three big areas. First being maintaining our infrastructure in a transparent, proactive, and cost-effective way. We have a lot of capital needs, and I would want to prioritize long-range planning for our facilities while also proactively seeking federal infrastructure money that I hope is on its way to towns and municipalities. Second, I would want to support environmental and smart growth reforms. 
We live in a beautiful place, as we all know. We want to protect our environment and maintain the character of our town, but also think about how to incentivize growth that we want and smart investments like green energy. And then finally, I'm also running to help support our youth in our schools. As I just said, I'm a mom of two kids. Um, I believe we have a lot of work to help our children recover from the pandemic in terms of educational and mental health gaps. Um, our kids have been really cooped up and they also need outlets such as outdoor sports to begin restarting normal healthy activities and friendships. And I wanna help proactively support our children and improve our schools fields and facilities from the select board standpoint. Ultimately, as a select board member, I wanna help our town pivot out of the pandemic and look forward to the future to make our town a better place to live. And that's why I'm running. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. And I, I will mention, I don't think I said, there'll be closing a closing argument uh, as well for a couple of minutes. But Paul, up to you. So thank you for uh, hosting this and thank you for inviting uh, everyone here. I'm delighted to be here. I am, uh, my background is, uh, well, I've lived in town about 22 years. I moved here after completing my medicine training. My uh, training is, I went to Georgetown undergraduate, Georgetown graduate school, and then Georgetown medicine. Did my training up in Boston, and I fell in love with Cohasset. So we've set our roots down here. We have uh, gotten involved locally. Um, I had uh, a wonderful experience with uh, the last 23 years we've lived here, raised my two boys. They have both graduated as public school graduates from Cohasset High School. I grew up uh, as a uh, one of nine and I was the youngest. Uh, my, my mom was a single mom, raised us all, and we all went through public school. So I have a deep uh, support and desire to support public schools. My background here in town, I, when we moved here in 1997, I got involved very early on with the schools and began uh, giving small grants to the principals in the high school and grade schools for unrestricted grants to help the schools because I knew they needed that. I subsequently joined the CEF, the Cohasset Education Foundation. I was there for seven years and developed the CEF uh, from the very beginning as it was reborn in the new CEF, which we see now is very, very successful. Uh, and I am delighted that it has been as successful as it, as it has been. Along with that, I was six years on the school committee and loved working with the, the administration. I did an awful lot of work at the state level getting funding for special education at the maximum level for many years at the 75% requirement which the state is required to do in several years of that. Following that, there was a special town meeting, which I organized to, to get monies into the capital uh, improvement uh, structure for the town, to get monies into OPED for retirement benefits, and to secure that the monies that were there are available for capital improvement of the town. The following year, I ran for Board of Selectmen, and I felt that the schools needed a voice on the Board of Selectmen, but also there was an awful lot more that could be done at the Selectmen level. So for the last six years, I've been on the Board of Selectmen, which is now the Select Board, uh, soon to be changed in, in name uh, for good reason. And I'm delighted to see what we've done in the last six years. I think the, uh, the board has been a wonderful group. We've done a, a great deal of work on infrastructure. As the pandemic struck, we had invested early on in cabling the building so we could pivot quickly to this sort of program we see here, where there's an available internet access for the town. And we did remarkably, remarkably better than a lot of the local towns, which had difficulty in the first several months before they could really learn how to uh, get up and running uh, and govern. So I'm, I'm delighted that the town, as a member of the, the board, as part of that, allowed for this infrastructure to allow for the, the town to keep running. Uh, my, my work and my professional uh, job helped the board immensely, I believe, in the town in getting the, the pandemic organized for uh, how, to, how to defend against it, how to prepare for it, and how to keep it controlled. I look forward in the in the near future now, in the next three years, if the people of Cohasset vote for me, 
I'd be delighted to, to serve and look for the, the things which I really love is that good schools. I want to see good, clean, open space. I want to see the harbor to stay clean, which involves looking at options for the sewering. The, the other big things are infrastructure projects, which I'm a big proponent of town hall. I believe it's affordable and I think we need it. I think that's part of what the town as, as a community deserves and needs. In addition, we need far more open space and open fields and I'll be working on finding locations for additional open space that's available for the entire town. Uh, I thank you for, for this uh, invite and I'm always available. So thank you for this time. Great, Paul, thank you. All right, so, and before we start out with our first question, um, again, I wanna get to a lot of this stuff. I wanna give everybody a chance. So if you're going a little long, I'm gonna get one of these little emojis up here, the little hand, and that'll be a signal to you. Wrap it up real quick, because I don't wanna interrupt people, but I will if we need to, just to keep things going, okay? All right, first topic, town hall renovations. So here we go again, right? Uh, town meeting is going to be voting on whether to pay for new renovation plans uh, at the next town meeting. Let's start out with uh, Jean. Jean, how are you going to vote on this and, uh, and why? Sure. So I already have voted on this. Um, as an advisory committee member, I voted back in early April on the town warrant article, which is going to be before town meeting which is a request to spend $750,000 on plans. Um, my position then and my position now is the same, which is that I would like to see a specific concrete proposal detailing how we are going to pay for the overall project cost, which is projected to be between 13 to $14 million, if not more, out of the, um, funding sources that are currently being proposed. And by way of background, I, um, I asked often on advisory committee for that information. And the information that I ultimately received was that the plan, as far as I understand it, is to get 4 million from CPC, 3 million of which will be a forward loan into the future for CPC, 1 million in free cash, and then use one million of the towns money in free cash and then we hope to get state or federal grants that will be repurposed to pay for the town hall leaving approximately assuming all of that happens mm -hmm. leaving approximately seven million dollars to pay for through a bond that's being financed by the operating budget that bond could range between four hundred thousand a year to seven hundred thousand a year depending on uh, the term of the bond, it could be between 20 and 30 years. So my question continues to be, how specifically are we going to be financing that money through the operating budget? Because from where I sit, that appears to be a lot of money to fund through the operating budget. Um, so that was my primary and big concern that I have that we don't yet have those details. The town is still working through it, but to me, the devil's in the details and i do have concerns about not having that information so that's one two is that the last time around the public did weigh in through a vote at the ballot majority said no and that was for a project that was less expensive so before we spend seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is a lot of money for us on another set of plans i would like to understand whether there's public support behind this project because i don't want to waste money on plans if that is in fact not true. So well, I think town meetings, Jean, town meetings coming up, you're gonna to have to vote at town meeting. Yes. So you're saying you, you need to see something more before you vote in favor of this? Yes, so I already, um, on the advisory committee, I recommended no on the town warrant article. So okay. I've already voted. I misunderstood. So you voted You voted no, and you, you're, uh, you want more information before you'll actually uh, could vote yes on this. Yes, and those are the reasons I expressed Okay, got at it. advisory committee, which remain the same. And I, okay. I still haven't seen a plan. Paul, what about you? So as you know, I, I look at the town hall as one of the infrastructures and one of the institutions of our town. If 
And you, you have to go back to, you know, what is America about? And Alexander de Tocqueville, when he came to the United States and he toured America, what he was impressed with, he was impressed with Americans. And he said, they live in modest homes, but they invest and they desire to have the, the institutions of their society funded and to look as goals for their society. Among that, town halls, courthouses, churches. So I am 100% behind replacing the town hall. This is now the fifth or potentially sixth iteration of a new town hall. The town hall, there's wiring from 1920. I've been down there, I've toured it. The, the annex is miserable. And if you want to keep putting paint on that walls, it's going to come down. It needs to be replaced. How are we going to fund it? Well, let's go back to the last round. When, when the vote at town hall floor was 71% in favor of it, what failed was a debt override. So exclusionary debt override failed only by 30 votes, three zero votes. That was a, a small margin. What we can do if the town does not want to do exclusionary debt, which is rolling off, and in three years we'll have no exclusionary debt at all, we could certainly get money from CBC. We will, I will certainly work at the state level looking for state funding, which is in the, the, the prior iteration, there was a line item 1582, which had $1 million that was available for the town if we voted for it. And that was in the state budget. That's no longer available. I'll try again to get more monies from the state and I will do my best to, to ensure that happens. We can clearly pay for this through, if you take operating budget, if you take capital needs that are available in the, in the capital uh, portions of, of the reserves, we can do this. We have over, well, we have probably four to 500,000 of exclusionary debt rolling off per year. And in three years, we'll have none. That will be able to be incorporated into available monies in the, in the levy, which we will continue to, to carry. And so we would be able to afford this, not only just in the operating budget, but using other mechanisms such as state funding, Return. some of it from free cash, some of it from CPC. And if necessary, we can always do either bans or we can do a, a very small exclusionary debt bond. I don't think we need the exclusionary debt bond and the town doesn't want it. So we will find a way to do it. All right, Paul. So Paul's, Paul's a solid yes. Gene still needs to be convinced. Last word, one minute, Gene. So right now, we don't pay for police overtime out of our operating budget. That is a cost of 300000 up to 450000 based on projections. When advisory committee asked, why do we not do that? We should, re we should roll this recurring expense into the operating budget the answer was, we can't do that. The budget is too tight. So now we are talking about rolling an expense that is even larger than what we have to, we, what we know we have to pay our police officers to work. And so again, I go back to the devil's in the details. I would like to see the details because while there's a bunch of ideas out there, the specifics are very important, particularly where I hear on advisory, that we cannot afford to pay the police out of our regular budget and rely on free cash. And so I really think it's important that we have an understanding, particularly if those assumptions don't come true. And then we have to find a, a large amount of money out of the operating budget. And so I think planning and being careful is critical. Um, and I think it's also important to consider that there's a large amount of people that also want money for other projects, and it is important to have public, a majority of public support for this project as well. All right, Gene, but this, this vote's coming up pretty soon, and I understand you'd like some more information. Do you think you're going to get more information? And if you don't, you're going to be a no? Is that it? Uh, and and let, I, I don't think that there's any information that will be forthcoming because I've been asking for that for quite some time. It's now... Okay multiple months since my requests have been on the table. And, um, you know, I'm willing to consider it, but I haven't seen it. All right, so it sounds like uh, a strong yes from Paul and a probably no from Jean on the vote for a town at town meeting on the <laughs> town hall. All right, let's go to our next topic. Um, there, uh, this next topic has been generating a lot of buzz lately. Uh, and that is whether or not to install lighting at the lower fields of the Barnes Little League complex. 
on North Main Street. Now, first, I have to get full disclosure. I was president of the Little League when we built those fields, so I, I know a little about the background. But so again, full disclosure. But let's start with Paul on this one. Paul, um, what's your approach on this topic, and and how should the board proceed? Well, I went back the last. Well, Please close data. I'm sorry, someone, is, is there, someone have a comment? Please, no, no, no one is allowed to comment. Please okay. mute your phone if you're watching. There's only the candidates and myself should be live. Paul? So yeah, so there, the big problem in town is there are not enough fields and that's probably the biggest problem. And from the point of view, there's not a lot of flat open areas for fields. And so one key thing is to try to get enough fields that are open available and playable is is a key thing i believe that if you put the, the lights in that will give you probably two to three hours per night seven days a week that's not going to solve the main problem not having enough fields for for the for participation i think that the key element here is to try to get enough fields try to get enough area the numbers of hours that will be available in the evening lighting in a very residential area is not going to solve that problem. So I think if you look behind Deer Hill, there's a field there. If you look behind Osgood, there's another field that's potentially developable as well. And there may be other areas available that the town can look at to try to develop into fields. I'm not certain that the Little League fields have limited hours such that they've had canceled Little League games. Now, there may be some older kids that are playing that may have to be rescheduled. The area there is very residential. It's not like Hingham, which is right by the high school. It's not like Hull, which is either in a municipal area or at the spit. This is a very residential area, and I think we need to take that into account. All right, so Paul, what, what I think I'm hearing is that you are against lighting the, the Barnes Fields, uh, and you'd rather just see new fields created in town. I, I think that's one answer, absolutely. And if it does go to the board, there's it's not a simple, you know, quick put up the lights as it is and turn the lights on. It would still have to go to zoning. We still have to go to planning, and it would still have to go to town meeting uh, as a vote with with the the town. I, I would not I would not say we put them up without going to the town and saying, is this something we want in a very residential neighborhood. Well, I, I, I understand going to the zoning because the towers would be higher than 30 feet. Um, not sure I understand planning and town meeting. Why would it go to town meeting? I mean, we, we I, put I, up I would, lights at I, alumni field. And, I, I would recommend this vote is important enough to go to town meeting. All right. Jane, what's your position on this? Um, well, my position is twofold. One, I do think that there is a reasonable solution to light up those fields. At a, there's three fields, I think, at a minimum, and we're talking about two of the fields that are um, submerged in subterranean, right? That's the proposal on the table. Um, if I was elected to the select board, I would be interested in trying to find a solution to light up the fields, at least one of them. There is a growing number of families in our town. It's a big demographic that's increasing. Right now, Little League, just Little League itself, has up to 500 kids now. That's a lot. If you drive past on the weekends, there's there's a lot of kids playing, particularly weekday nights. Um, and moreover, it's not just about having more fields during the daytime. It's about the reality too that when you're playing some of these night games, when you're playing some of these games, parents want to be able to see their children play if they're working jobs and they can't make it there during the day the night really is the opportunity for you know parents to be able to watch their children which i think is a positive thing and so i do think that there is a big demand um i do not think unfortunately that there will be a solution quickly enough to get new fields online to meet the demand of today's children. Um, that said, I do think that there, and I agree with Paul, that there certainly is a demand beyond the ball fields in terms of field space. We have a huge amount of new sports. We've got um, baseball, but also softball, lacrosse, field hockey. So fields are gonna be in high demand for all of these sports, soccer. Um, fields are gonna be in very high demand. and. You know, one thing that 
uh, I would do if I was elected is really proactively try to move that forward. And that's something that I did on the advisory committee when I saw a warrant article, draft warrant article come through for a tennis court study where the tennis courts were being studied by a company that studies courts and fields professionally for a living. This is all they do. I asked whether we could now add fields into that as well. And the town went back and they said, yeah, we can do this. And so now the warrant article says tennis courts and fields. So we have a holistic proposal to really begin addressing this. But I think that it's important that we do both things at once. We address the current needs right now with respect to getting a solution on the table that's respectful of the neighbors, but also you know, lights up the fields to address the baseball demand, but also looks at the bigger field picture as well and really moves on that and gets that decision and those steps happening rather than talking about it really, you know, moving forward proactively to begin making both of these things happen. Um, so, and, so you're you're in favor of, I mean, it sounds like both of you want some new fields in town. Um, there's agreement on that. So uh, if you were queen of Cohasset, would you put lights there? Yes, in the baseball fields? Yes. Yes, I do yeah. believe that there is a you know reasonable solution to put lights up. Um, I agree that there is more discussion to be had, including um, you know steps that may need to be taken. But right now, there's nothing happening. It's not even on the agenda for the select board. It's just sort of hanging out there in limbo. And as I talk to many voters, many residents, there's a lot of frustration with that. So at a minimum. The discussion needs to publicly happen, including for the sake of people who are really interested in the lights and also the neighbors, and begin moving forward, including moving forward to a decision so people know where the select board stands. So, Paul, if you were king of Cohasset, it sounds like you would say no lights. Uh, you're, it sounds like what I'm hearing is concern about the neighbors that this is, is in a neighborhood and um, let's put the fields someplace else. Is that what you're saying? I think to put lights there, even in the lower fields, I, I really believe that is, if you're going to do that, they ought to be multi-purpose fields. Then put in a movable mound and, and put in, you know, a, a schedule of events that are there, whether it's soccer, whether it's lacrosse, whether it's baseball, whether it's softball, but it's a very residential neighborhood. It, it is not similar to a lot of the other towns. Uh, and, but would that satisfy the neighbors' concerns, Paul? I mean, that, that there'd be more time that the lights would be used. Uh, you know, this baseball the, Little League is primarily spring. Now you're so opening the, up to the fall so, and so forth. So this is the problem. When in, a, in a densely residential neighborhood, that these are the questions that are going to have to come up. And whether you decide that or you try to find alternative options with more fields. And this is the reason why I think this should go to, go to a town meeting vote. I, I don't think that... You know the policy of the board is one that would dictate that you put those in or not the the, the board is a policy board it, it we don't have a great deal of power except for the warrant you know uh, cemeteries and and that's about it we, we own some property in town that's it mm, okay i'm still not sure that this would be that you can't really do advisory votes at town meeting but but i, I get your point you'd like to get a broader um, sense of, of what people would uh, would like. Okay, Absolutely. good. Thank you. All right, um, that's great. So now the third topic uh, I want to talk about is um, well, I, I think we can all agree on this: that Cohasset pays crazy water and sewer bills. Uh, apparently, there are moves now to increase both uh, the water and sewer, and um, I think ten percent. The sewer is actually on the town. Uh, on the warrant for town meeting uh, to go up by 10%. Now I know the, the board of selectmen or select board, I guess it's gonna be, that's gonna take me a while to get used to that. Um, it doesn't have direct authority over all these issues. But Gene, what can you do as a select person um, to uh, stop the madness or, or do something with these rates? Well, there's one immediate thing that may be happening that is incredibly important. And it's, again, relating to following the money. Um, you know, this is something I do for a living. And so this is what I would do as a select board member. And as we know, there's federal funding that is now becoming available to towns and municipalities, specifically the American Rescue Act plan 
it has been enacted and the United States Treasury is about to set out guidelines on how um, that can be used by towns and cities and municipalities. Uh, and so one thing that I would like to see is whether we can have a discussion about using some of that money that should be coming through to Cohasset and the amount is uncertain right now, but using some of that money to fund water and sewer infrastructure updates in order to help defray the cost to taxpayers of what is, and yes, incredibly expensive water and sewer rates. Um, and, and, and this is where, again, transparency with finances matters too, because I do think that that money can be used in all different ways, right? And it's important that the taxpayers know that they may have a choice that, for example, the money may not necessarily, um, if, if you know, there's a choice between using it to pay for the town hall project or to defray water and sewer costs, people should know that and be able to make an informed decision on how we spend that grant money. And they should know, you know, that we, if we, you know, if we do this, if we use it to pay for the town hall project, that's money we could have used to reduce water and sewer bills. Because right in the act itself, it says that it's meant to address water and sewer infrastructure. So I think that that's just one example of federal money that is specifically coming down the pike and we should get more guidance on this month. And I think that we should continue to be opportunistic and very carefully watch the details and advocate for it. I would, as a select board member, I would like to not only put this on us for the select board to be accountable, but also our elected representatives on the state and federal level. I would like to see them at our select board meetings explaining what, in, what money is available and how they are going to help our town get that money in the door to begin help dealing with these infrastructure concerns that we have because a part of the reason that the water bills are increasing so much or that they're seeking an increase is to clean the water in order to make sure that we reduce PFAS or cancer causing chemicals in our water which is important and we really should do but it is expensive and so this is why we have you know, this dynamic happening with these incredibly expensive um, water bills. It's surface water that is hard to clean. And so we really need to be aggressively looking for money. And when we get money in the door, we need to be transparent with citizens about the choices that are being made about the money because it's really up to them at the end of the day. All right, Paul, I'm about to dig a well. I mean, I'm, I'm just gonna give up. Uh, should I, or is there some hope on the horizon? Well, I mean, there's a there's a couple of things out there. These these are enterprise funds, so it's a little more difficult for the town to just transfer monies over. Now, the CARES Act, which we already have received, can only be used for COVID related costs. Now, one of the costs is because people were home, not like me, but many people work from home, and the use of sewer and water went up. So the overall usage of our town water and sewer did increase. And she's correct, this is surface water. So the water needs to be processed from all of the organics that are out there. In addition to the eternal chemicals that are the, the basically the Teflon type chemicals on highly fluorinated carbon uh, debris that gets in the water. It's expensive. It's expensive to, to get clean water for the town. And we had problems, even our, one of the well fields downtown, people were dumping. And so we had to shift out of that area back up to, the reservoir system, which is expensive to do and clean and ship. The other thing is the price of electricity has gone up. So electrical costs have increased both from the sewer, which uses an awful lot to process and clean, and from the water department. And I think if we place some easily placeable uh, uh, solar panels, we can cut the cost. We can do on-site. It does not need to cross a right away, so we don't need to worry about national grid. We can use what's available from the solar system using battery storage technology and we can cut the cost of the electrical usage up there and at both at both plants and that's one easy way to to cut the cost down or certainly to trim them from the point of view of the sewer they <clears throat> did not have a raise in their their price for about 10 years and this came up at the board of selectmen uh, the 
the board meeting, uh, CASIP uh, select board meeting, as far as how do you go about increasing the cost? Because you know that salaries are going up and you know that electrical costs are going up and that the necessary cleaning of whether it's wastewater going out or, or water to the town is going up. How do, you, you know, how do you do that all at once with a 10% rise? Is it easier to do a gentle rise a few percent a year or do you do it in a lump sum? I'm not sure the right answer to that, but at this point, unfortunately, there's been no rise in the, the cost for about 10 years and it will have to be you know, to cover costs. But looking at like water, you just got to go next door and situate. I've had a lot of friends who have moved to situate and they tell me what their water bills are. And it really it makes you want to cry. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable how cheaper it is. So they have to deal with issues as well. I mean, should we be joining um, Aquarian or whatever they're called now in North situate or uh, NWRA or something? Or should we just start, do something completely different? Because other towns don't pay... They drink as much water as we do. They use as much water as we do, but they're not paying anywhere near what we're paying. Yeah, the, the cost of the MRWA is very high, so I would not say join them, no. Uh, I, I do think we can cut costs using, you know, the, uh, again, cutting down electrical costs would be one key thing. We did put, you know, a lot of money into the water system when we built the dam in the you know, late 70s, so that's still being, being paid off. We are able to sell some of it to, uh, you know, to Hingham, uh, but the problem is now that the state is requiring that the limited amount of water that's available cannot be sold. So we may be limited on that as well. Uh, you may be right. I mean, there's a lot of deep wells. One option may be to, to, you know, put down a deep well and we can get, you know, deep water well as opposed to surface well. That's one other option. That would be a, a big infra infrastructure plan, though. All right. Jane, last yes. thought on this. Yeah, so just to weigh in, unfortunately, I don't think alternative energy is going to get us far with the sewer and the water. And I think I appreciate the thought, but um, the uh, alternative energy committee presented before the advisory board and I asked these exact questions. The sewer plant is too small to put panels on top and there's issues with the water plant in light of the wetlands and the sludge um, factor, which I don't profess to know all of the specific details about sludge, but given the swamp and the wetlands, they said that it's harder to do than they thought in terms of trying to defray some of the cost through solar panels and solar arrays. And so I do think that we're going to have to start looking at more um, options aggressively, whether it's bringing in federal money, like I just talked about, or Mark, to your point, looking at how other towns are controlling these costs and whether they present better options. And we do have 10% of the town that's using Aquarian right now. And I would be curious to see their experiences because as we know, Hingham just went through a pretty epic battle with Aquarian in order to get independence from them and create their own water company. And so um, I think that has to be a very, very careful conversation and we enter into it with eyes wide open. Um, no, I, I understand, I'm just throwing it out. Yeah. Um, expressing, I think, frustration that you you will see around town um, with with the rates. Um, well, it sounds like both of you um, agree that the rates are very high and want to look into it and figure out uh, a way. Hopefully, that we can um, come down somewhere around our, our neighbors. All right, let's move on to the fourth issue. Uh, fourth issue here, um, and this one involves the character of the town. Uh, blasting of ledge and clear cutting of uh, land seems to be happening on a daily basis all around Cohasset. Uh, over the years, several citizens groups have tried and usually unsuccessfully to change town bylaws to address these actions that many people believe are adversely affecting the character of our town. Paul, has the Board of Selectmen taken enough of a leadership role in these efforts? I think it, it's tough from the, the leadership point of view at the board. I, I am really upset when they clear cut and they blast and it, you know, there was a, a house down on Forest Ave and the concussion of a blast sheared the, the, the sewer pipe going into, the, into their septic system. And so this is the sort of thing that you really have to, and I, I urge all of those articles on the, on the warrant this time around to please vote yes on all of those for the, these sorts of 
items that are preventing clear cutting, preventing blasting, ledge removal, because that is part of the character of the town. I, you know, I, I like to see a, a nice forested area and it's gotten to the point where people buy the piece of property, they clear cut it or they clear cut it before they sell it so that it, the person who buys it isn't you know, caught with a, you know, cutting everything down. I, I think this is part of what we need to do. Yes, we've been pushing strongly for it. Now there's some very good articles on the warrant and I, I strongly support all of them for that reason. Gene, uh, what do you think of the articles coming up at town meeting on the, this issue? So uh, I also voted yes as an advisory committee member on the zoning bylaw article with respect to land alteration. Um, I share, I think, the frustration by you, Mark and Paul, with respect to land alteration. Um, I think the zoning bylaw working group has done an excellent job in really trying to figure out a bylaw that is both responsive to the needs of Cohasset, but also legally sufficient as well and won't unduly impact property owners' rights because there are times when, for example, you wanna remove trees that are hazardous or falling down, you really should be doing that. And so they found a nice balance with the land alteration article to really get at the heart of the problem. Another thing though that you asked about, Mark, was um, ledge. Ledge is not being addressed in the land alteration article. And a part of the reason for that is that other towns have tried to get at ledge removal and it has um, unfortunately routinely been struck down by our courts in light of uh, some pretty strong property rights surrounding how people uh, dispose of or address subterranean ledge or at the ground level ledge. And so now the zoning bylaw working group is really taking a hard look at above grade ledge in order to see whether we can um, create legally defensible bylaws. And so I think that my experience as a planning board member and as a lawyer, I think will be helpful on the select board to helping address that. And there's one last point I wanna make in terms of um, moving forward. You asked whether the select board can do more on this issue. And I will tell you that one thing that jumped off the page to me when I moved to Cohasset back in 2008 and joined the planning board was zoning enforcement. It is not enough to just create the bylaws. We need to enforce them. When we have a law on the books, including a law that many citizens have supported and work really hard to pass, we need to make sure that the town is actively doing its job, including through the direction and oversight of the select board to make sure our zoning laws are enforced. This is incredibly important to me. It's gonna be incredibly important to have that proactive tone out of the gate when we start to pass, if and when we pass these land alteration bylaws. It's not enough to have it sitting on the books. It needs to be enforced because otherwise it will be nullified and the town and its people will not be protected. So that would be something that I would strongly focus on and make sure that those who work for Cohasset understand that our laws need to be enforced to protect our environment. Paul, what, what's the situation with the building inspector? Uh, Bob re, uh, retired, did I hear? He has retired, yes. So do we yes. have a new permanent inspector in now? Yes. Okay, and, and do you think as, do you feel that he or she will give the kind of enforcement? I, I assume you you agree. Oh yeah, with I, I think so. I mean, absolutely. This is you know this is one of the problems with enforcement is, uh, you know, the litigious nature of our society will take it to court and they'll do their best to defend their rights as a as a landowner. Uh, you know, the, if you look at how the ledge is removed, there's a there's a bylaw of how tall you can build your building, but there's not one to how deep you can blast a hole. So there's a lot of places where there's subterranean, there's two levels down below the, the house. And that's where it really has just destroyed a lot of the, the nature of our, our town. And I, I agree with her. I, I think we, we need to try to fashion a ledge removal bylaw, which is enforceable and legal, which, you know, everywhere I've seen, if you blast and you dig down, you can go as far down as you want. You just can't go above 30 feet. So that's one of the, the, the big problems with, with that. Oh, so the, I'd say the group that's looking at the above ground ledge, uh, Gene, tell them to 
check out a bylaw that went to town meeting about 20 years ago, some guy on Beach Street uh, put up and uh, got the majority, but missed on the two thirds. And um, we see the result of it. That's right. All right. Um, let's ask, uh, I, I think next I want to ask Gene, um, you touched on it, I think both of you, COVID-19. Uh, uh, the town seems to have handled the COVID-19 um, pretty well. Uh, would you have done anything differently if uh, you were on board? I think, I think the town did handle COVID-19 relatively well. I think the one area that I think was a real significant struggle was for parents who were working from home or not um, and trying to address remote learning, the hybrid model, and dealing with their children um, being isolated. A lot of us did not have the luxury of just being able to work our jobs. We had to, you know, every half an hour race back and forth to try to help our children get online, figure out assignments. That's particularly hard for children that are younger. Once you get below a certain grade level, it was a real struggle. And it wasn't necessarily anything that was, um, you know, that the, t the teachers and the school administration and the school committee really worked tirelessly. But I do think one frustration was that, you know, parents saw how hard our schools and administration and committee were working. And there was still, I think, um, a, a feeling of frustration that other members of the government, the town government, including the select board, were just sort of off doing their thing and that it wasn't an all hands on deck situation. There were other towns, for example, we were seeing where um, you would see, for example, in Hingham, Hingham was renting out um, property in order to have their kindergartners go back to school. They rented out the old St. Jerome school. And there just wasn't much discussion, including public discussion about options and whether we could be creative in order to help the kids come back to school and reopen, particularly at some of these really early young grades where the kids really needed significant help. And so having talked to a lot of parents, I know that is a pain point. And there was a desire to see more of an all hands on deck approach with helping our school committee and school administration, including from the vantage point of the select board, which does have the power over, you know, the town property and, and also just generally has a voice as the executive body of the town in terms of how we coordinate and help each other. And so that I think is probably the primary place that I would say we could have done better. And even if the answer is we still would have gotten the same result, it would have been nice to see that tighter coordination and support as a parent to see that really truly everyone was trying um, in order to manage the situation for our children who are going to be suffering, I think, from some significant educational gaps and struggling, I think, from some mental health consequences as well. Well, having supervised my um, kindergarten grandson at Osgood on Zoom remote yeah. kindergarten, um, that, that was <laughs> quite an experience. <laughs> uh, Paul, um, could you have done more or do you feel um, pretty good about what you guys well, did? Well, I, I can tell you, you know, from the, from the sheer numbers of infections, the town mm -hmm. did extremely well. We are unbelievably well suited for quarantining. We have extra bathrooms, extra bedrooms. We are uh, a community that has a lot of area. We work tirelessly. And I can tell you from the point of view at the South Shore, we had unbelievable outbreaks in the South Shore. Cohasset did very well. I work closely with the fire department, with the Department of Public Health, with the emergency management system, and with the police department to try to contain our our departments from getting uh, infected. So the police department did extremely well. Fire department, DPW, the, the town government itself, as well as the schools did very well on controlling and preventing the spread. It was, it was, a, it was yeoman's work from all of those departments. It was yeoman's work from the school department. My, my hat is tipped to them. They did unbelievable pivoting. In a matter of a week, they tried to get as much as they could for computers at home, to get internet access, to get curriculum up and running. The same thing was going on with the police department doing 
touchless uh, sign-outs with both the fire and police department, trying to get DPW to prevent uh, contacts with one another. This is very difficult when you've got uh, a town like ours where the town government is very personal. It's very, the police are personal, the, the fire department is personal, and it became individual. It became touchless. It was a, a very difficult time for this town. They have done, and this town has done remarkably well. Uh, you know, my, my job was in a, a different situation. I, you know, I saw things I don't want to ever see again, but I can tell you the town is coming out of this extremely well. I'm very proud of them. I'm proud of what the school has done, what the, the, the town departments have done, and we're getting out of it. You know, I'll, I'll mention one quick thing. About an hour ago, the FDA has approved the Pfizer Biogentech uh, vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds. And this is FDA approval for emergency use authorization. I strongly recommend speak to your physician, your pediatrician. These are, this vaccine is extremely good and effective, safe, and can get kids back to school safely, will get them from spreading to the teachers, to the staff, to the moms and dads. Um, yeah, I think, I think we did a, a great job. Could we have done better? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we, we had all hands on deck. So one of the things that has come out of this uh, at the local level is like this, um, Zoom meetings. So all of our, the selectmen, all of the boards meeting by Zoom and so forth. Um, you know, I think there were mixed reactions. Some people like, you know, to be there in the room. Uh, yeah, but on the other hand, I've got to guess that people, um, the participation was a lot greater when you could just sit at home and uh, tune in, uh, as opposed to having to get up after work and drive down to town hall or something like that. Is there any future for, for Zoom meetings at the town level, Paul? Oh, I think so. I mean, this has shown what transparency you can get with the, with the town. Uh, I can tell you the percentages of people that you know watch the select board meetings, watch the water department meetings, watch the, the school committee meetings, it rose dramatically. In addition, the, there were far fewer number of uh, necessary quorums that were broken where you couldn't have a meeting. You could actually do it from home. You do it from work. You didn't make it home from work in time. You, you did the meeting from work or you did it from home. And honestly, it, it's a lot more comfortable than, you know, grabbing all your junk going down to, to town hall. You lose the personal touch. You lose that, uh, the, the facial expressions. You use the, the, the kindness, the comments, the, the concerns that you get from the, the, population and from the people in town and from other board members. So that uh, is, uh, that's the downside. But we did, because of this, have the infrastructure in place and we were able to, you know, quickly pivot to Zoom a lot faster than a lot of the other local communities could do. And that's a testament to what went on in the last several years of building the infrastructure of cabling the, the, the town buildings. Um, so Jane, Jane what, do, what do you think? Is should we go all Zoom all the time uh, after the pandemic, uh, go completely back to in-person, mix it up? Um, we've got about two minutes. Um, so I, I, I do think that Zoom allows a lot more people to be included and participate for all the reasons that Paul was just talking about, but also I'd bring up as a parent, if you have little kids, it's much easier to participate on Zoom. So if you want, more people to be able to participate in town government and really mean it, Zoom is a place that you can do that. Um, there is the, I like meeting people, I like seeing them, I like building that relationship. It's easier to do in person. And so I agree that I think we'll just have to see how it goes. I think that there could be a mix. Um, I think it could be though that a lot of meetings probably remain in Zoom or maybe there's a hybrid approach. But I do think that the, the popularity of Zoom meetings is also calling into question the amount of meeting space we need if it's actually online now, right? It is a significant cost savings if I think we were to, instead of using, you know, town facility space, we're using essentially, you know, cheap $50 a month Zoom space online. And so there's also a financial uh, savings that, you know, we could reach through Zoom as well that we should probably talk about and consider. Brave new world, very, very interesting. All right, well, that's all the time we have for our questions. 
Uh, at this point, let's um, have our closing statements. Paul, we'll start with you. Try to keep it around two, three minutes. Sounds good. So, you know, once again, I'm running for re-election. I would love for to be re-elected. I would love the votes from the people in town. I've spent my whole uh, time in Cohasset involved with all of the, everything involved in town, whether it's the schools, whether it's the town government, uh, my career, I've sunk the, the roots down, the roots are deep. I've got trees outside that are, are 20 years old. And as you know, I grow pears out of bottles right from the earth to Cohasset. This is, this is the town I love. I love the town. I love the people. I would love to give another three years for the town and I'm willing to do it. I will do my best to find things that we can do, like getting a new town hall, you know, upping the game of the schools, which I've been doing for, for years and I will continue to do that. Find free open space, find more available things the town can do and do well, whether it's, you know, making sure the sewer system is, is clean, the water is clean, the harbor is clean, the, the streets are safe. Uh, it's a great town. I love it. I mean, I, I, I couldn't ask for a better place to raise my kids, to live and enjoy. So I ask your vote on June 5th. Thanks, Paul. Jean, bring us home. All right, well, I also ask for your vote on June 5th, and I appreciate everyone considering me uh, to be a select board member. I believe that I bring a wealth of government experience, both locally, but also on the state and federal level, knowledge and energy to really move Cohasset into the future as we recover from the pandemic. I wanna help bring us into the future. And I do want to thank Paul for all of your public service in terms of serving Cohasset, which I think is um, just a real testament to you, Paul. And so I'm running for this seat because I do think that Cohasset can and should do better in our future. We know our infrastructure needs help. We know we need to maintain and improve it. And I believe we need to plan, prioritize, and be fiscally responsible and transparent when doing so. I do believe that you can be successful in getting projects done while also being financially prudent. We also need strong advocates, including to our state and federal partners, to bring home money to Cohasset in order to help defray taxpayer costs. Money is an issue in this town, and I do think that projects are going to have more success if we can be clear about the money and also seek money to defray that cost. Second, I think we need environmental and zoning refor reforms that we already talked about. As a select board, if elected to the select board, I would be the only lawyer on the board and former planning board member, which I think is important experience to help proactively move these reforms forward. And then finally, I believe that we need to support our families and kids better. I'm a mom with a kid in, in Deer Hill and one going into the middle school. I've seen the state of those schools and the facilities. They need work, they need repair, they need someone to help move it forward into the future. I believe I bring an important parent perspective to the board to help represent the growing and large di uh, demographic of families in our town. So I believe I have the experience, skills, and energy to help Cohasset do better and move forward into the future. And so I'd appreciate your vote and I appreciate your consideration. So thanks again to you, Mark, and, and thank you to you, Paul. All right, well, very good. So yeah, thank you to both of you, uh, not just for appearing tonight, but you both put in years and years of service and you're still willing to do it more, uh, which, is, which is great. And uh, I know I speak for everyone in town, we appreciate your, your getting involved. It, it can be thank, thankless jobs, but uh, that's terrific. All right, Coasset, there you have it. Uh, the two candidates have spoken. Uh, some issues they agree on and some issues they don't agree on. So hopefully tonight uh, has helped folks to make a more informed vote. And please do vote uh, at the election yep. and go to town meeting and vote. Participating in our town government is a very, very important and is really an obligation for everybody. All right, until uh, sometime later, uh, this is Mark DiGiacomo. Thank you very much, Gene. Paul, good night. Thank, Thank you, Mark. You. Thank you, Gene.